on Residence 104.4 FM. What was the big story this past week? It was, uh, I know there was a big one. I can't remember it now. What was it? Well, um, the, we will talk about RBS, the Royal Bank of Scotland. You out there listening to the show, most likely you own part of it. Uh, the British taxpayer owns 73% of Royal Bank of Scotland. But first, I want to uh, congratulate Residence FM and uh, give out our sincere thanks to all those who donated to Residence FM. They raised over 15,000 pounds, so they met their target, and you've kept them on air for yet another year. Oh, congratulations, all you listeners and pledgers and contributors. That's great news. <laughs> so let's talk about Royal Bank of Scotland. The British taxpayer owns the bank for the most part, three quarters of it. And they reported again the eighth year in a row um, losses. They lost two billion pounds. And a lot of it is to do with the fact that all their profits went to the United States in the form of fines. So they uh paid big fines last year for i think it was they've pay, they pay fines every year criminal fines uh no nobody ever gets sent to jail for the criminal charges but they get fined and most of it goes to the united states so last year i think it was forex rigging and partly for the mortgage backed securities that they sold to us investors but that is still coming down there's going to be a few billion pounds more they don't know yet how much more billions of pounds, but the shares are now down to two, 220p. Um, the taxpayer bought basically, I've read between 407p and 500p is what the taxpayer needs to break even. So you've got a long way to go before you can make any money back on that. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, that's true. The Royal Bank. Well, we know we have in our show coming up on Kaiser Report an interview with Nobu Su. He's a uh, Taiwanese uh, shipping billionaire, and a um, very interesting story because he is uh, apparently a victim of, of RBS. Remember, we, we talked about the RBS Global Restructuring Group. RBS had a division within the bank that would identify small to medium enterprises that were easy to destroy by simply cutting off the credit line. And then they did this to a number of companies. Uh, companies fail, then another division, then this global restructuring bank uh, group would come in and buy the uh, assets for pennies on the dollar, and then the bank would flip those assets for a pr quick profit. Uh, and they justified this as they needed to keep the bank open during the crisis, otherwise the whole economy would collapse. So this is classic case of terrorism, financial terrorism, uh, supported by an ideology of, of uh, jihadism. And um, so this guy had the same thing play out in, in his accounts, in his life, except it wasn't just 100,000 pounds that was stolen. It was uh, close, close to a billion, billion dollars. That was interesting because it, he, his story, you know, plays out over the financial crisis. And during those days when the whole, uh, there was, it was called a liquidity crisis at the time, if you recall, because there was no liquidity. Banks had no access and companies had no access to, to credit. Uh, and in particular, we talked about the shipping industry. This guy's a shipping tycoon. We talked about the shipping industry at the time and the shipping industry operates on a system called letters of credit. So you have to have these letters of credit before you're willing to send all, you know, those millions of dollars worth of goods in one uh, container ship and send it across the world. And also you pointed out that, you know, RBS is the biggest player in this new market that was created, a swaps market around shipping. I think they're called freight swaps. And before RBS got involved, before the bankers got involved, it was all over the counter. It was between the two parties. All of the um, the liquidity that was provided to the shipping market happened between each other, individuals. And then these bankers moved in and created these swaps. And that's when these swaps arrived that basically your money got stolen and just disappeared from your bank account and you don't know where it went. In his case, he, he, he was able through discovery to get a lot of the um, actual transactions and what happened in his account. And there was a huge payment, like a uh, $8.5 billion payment to J.P. Morgan from his account. But he didn't have any dealings with J.P. Morgan.
Mm, right, it's a clear case of racketeering. And during the liquidity crisis of that era, banks colluded and broke laws to um, engage in fraudulent transactions. And in this case, the guy's uh, statements were uh, loaded up with fraudulent transactions. And having worked on Wall Street myself for many years, I recognize, you know, the the, um, the, the pattern of uh, the fraud that was being committed. And I, I asked him on the show a, a, a very, I think, revealing question. I said, have you ever you know, donated to Hillary Clinton's political campaign. Uh, I could have easily have also asked, have you ever donated to uh, Cameron or any, any uh, UK politicians? And the answer was uh, no. And there's the rub. That's the problem. If you are not corrupt, if you don't give money to politicians, you will be targeted by the banks and have your money stolen. It could be the same for folks that are poor living in the UK that are being victimized and scapegoated and rounded up and sent off in boxcars to who knows where they'll end up. It could be small to medium enterprises that we've seen with RBS attacking those companies, stripping them, killing them, uh, destroying people's lives, uh, committing acts of financial terrorism. Or it could be a global shipping billionaire tycoon. doesn't matter. If you don't play a game, if you don't play ball, if you don't actively engage in corruption, you're in trouble. Well, speaking of billionaires, uh, Donald Trump continues to uh, soar ahead in the Republican race for nominee for president uh, for the race in 2016. And it's, it's quite interesting to watch the mainstream media fall apart on this because, you know, here's a headline. World trade falls 13.8% in dollar terms. And yet, if you read most of the headlines of the mainstream press or you tune into BBC News, where most people will be getting, I think it's something like 78% of Brits get their news from BBC News. And while it's not, uh, say, like China, where you know China, the Chinese government tells their news, their journalists, they tell them outright in a directive, don't say anything bad about the economy. Here... They're not overtly told that. They're, it's not like an outright open uh, sort of tyranny like that. They do it by their own because they don't want to, uh, George Osborne to feel bad. They see him at parties on the weekend. They go out to brunch with him and his family on the weekends. They, it's self-censorship. It's self-censorship. Uh, they, they, want everybody, they don't want to look like conspiracy theorists. They call, if, you, if, you say, if you point out that world trade is falling 13.8%, somebody must be suffering. Somebody who's not living in London or Vancouver or San Francisco or New York or Hong Kong where house prices are booming and they're earning more than any normal salary anywhere in the economy, your house is. So anybody outside that somebody, ha- th- those losses have to be coming from somebody. But the the beltway journalists as we call them in america those very connected to dc and the and power they never get out they never listen to those people they think of them they have increasing amount of contempt for those ordinary people out there who they think of as peasants and sludge and imbeciles and stupid and yet here we're seeing this like you know the emergence of somebody like donald trump a demagogue obviously but and they they act like they don't understand it. Maybe they don't because they just don't look outside and see this stuff. Mm. Well, they're groomed. They're groomed uh, in, in the education system. And they are then put in positions in the BBC as presenters. But they come fully, fully formed as you would, let's say, a suicide bomber that comes through a madrasa or something like that. I mean, here are these presenters on the BBC they have been inculcated with the hysterical propaganda of uh, exceptionalism, and uh, they know that their salaries, that are enormous, depend on their blatant lies. And if they want Chinese people, the Chinese presenters, uh, they get more than uh, the average salary of, uh, you know, say, four or five thousand dollars a year. They might make six thousand dollars a year. They're also financially motivated to play along. Same thing with uh, the British presenters on BBC. I mean, it's very obvious to me. And we had a case this past week where a big time UK journalist blew the whistle effectively on the entire scam that is uh, speech and media here in the UK. Okay, I'm talking about Paul Mason. 
who was at the BBC for many years. He's been at Chan he went over to Channel Four for two years, and he quit. And he, on his Twitter and in his article in the Guardian, he said, "Look, Ofcom makes doing journalism in this country impossible. Ofcom, of course, is part of the problem, along with." this institutionalized lying and propaganda that BBC and all presenters are uh, forced to swallow like, you know, ducks on a foie gras farm, all this nonsense. Well, that's the point, because uh, let's go back to that, uh, the headline I read. So you'll hear the headline, World Trade Falls 13.8% in dollar terms. So Paul Mason is basically suggesting in his Guardian piece that he would be presented with that and you want to go into it and say, oh, my God, well, our policies aren't working. How is this happening? We're in a deflationary spiral. But that the chancellor could then go to Ofcom and say, this is not fair and balanced. He has to show where my policies are counteracting this, how they're helping, and blah, blah, blah. So there's a sort of sense of not being panicked. Remember, we covered this many times. We've pointed out that I, I believe it was Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the Telegraph back in 2008, in March of 2008, uh, Bear Stearns collapsed, and that was on a Friday after the markets closed. And on that Friday morning, he told readers, you know, because of libel laws and because of that fair and balancing here, we're not allowed to mention, but there is a big, massive, huge investment bank in America about to collapse. All the U.S. media is talking about it. Google it, look it up, and you'll find it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's ridiculous in this day and age. Well, I mean, here's the okay. case. The story is global, global trade's down 13%, or global GDP. And so you have a deflationary spiral. Paul Mason's an economic journalist. So this is the way it works. So let's say he wants to go on TV and talk about this slowdown and, and the fact that these policies by the Bank of England and the government are failing. Okay. The, f to comply with the so-called impartiality laws, they'll say, well, you need an opposing view. And then a couple of things kick in. First of all, they'll say, the person that you have on to present the opposing view, they will say is not suitable. So let's say, uh, in other words, they, they don't seek opposing view. They don't seek impartiality. This is censorship masquerading as impartiality and the tricks that they use. And we've had direct experience on the BBC from being coerced into f propagandizing uh, lies from the government. And as we've said many times, and they use this impartiality as a as a cudgel i believe is the right shakespearean word in this case to beat people into submission to propagandize and lie so remember anyway to, with the paul mason so here he is you're right he wouldn't be disallowed from reporting and the way that they would say you need a suitable opposition you need we need to screen the opposition we need to vet the opposition oh we're out of time we have to go on the air we don't have an opposing view we didn't find the suitable uh, opposing view in our impartiality rules in time therefore we cannot present it so you cannot do the story instead we're going to cover dancing with the stars and it goes around and around and around and it's it's very similar to uh, that staged uh, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> what? Okay. Well, Max is uh, tired of that one, but uh, let's talk also about. Uh, well, I didn't know. I mean, I, 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 I uh, it's, it's a shame. Oh, anyway, so he quit. He quit bec because it's, um, it, it's, you know, for in British terms, you know, this is like um, somebody you know, setting themselves on fire in a square in, in Tunisia and starting a revolution, you know, it, but in British terms, it's just very, oh, well, I, I'm not happy with the Ofcom and their fake impartiality rules, so I'm quitting the Channel 4, and nobody really will talk about it. It's all very hush-hush, but this is a major whistleblowing scandal on U.S., uh, on the U.K. speech laws, that really rips rips the the, the the cover off what is now a you know and this is the same week of the Jimmy Scott uh, Savile reveals where seventy two cases were observed by the BBC executives and staff of children being abused over years. Well, well, the BBC is self regulating; they're not under Ofcom. It's, I didn't uh, say that they yeah. were. I'm saying that they observed seventy two cases of kids getting sexually abused. 
and they didn't do anything because of, there's only a couple of conclusions. Well, number one, they don't see a problem with kids being sexually abused, which is, which is an interesting case because in this country, most children are sexually abused. I don't, if you, any, anybody is within two or three degrees of someone who's been abused as a child from an adult. It's a sport here. It's not a crime. Well, number two, um, they feared for their jobs. Again, that's the propaganda trick. If you tell the truth, we'll fire you. Number three, uh, they, um, you know, the list goes on and on. Okay, let's move on to another topic. So, uh, of course, Boris Johnson this week, the mayor of London, he came out in support of a Brexit. And here's the resulting headline. The pound just hit a seven-year low, and there's no revival in sight. The pound has been clobbered this week, driven close to seven-year lows against the dollar, and analysts don't see any catalyst insight on that fall uh, to turn that around. So, of course, um, one of the things that we've been seeing in this global deflationary collapse, just like we saw back in the the previous global deflationary collapse of the 1930s, was that uh, there's been a policy of beggar thy neighbor. So everybody's been trying to lower their currency. Um, Of course, the euro has fallen against the, uh, the pound quite significantly since 2008. And uh, so... You would think that this is supposed to be a good thing, but uh, it's being presented as a bad thing now, uh, particularly because the the UK uh, does have a huge balance of trade problem. They don't, you don't make much, but what is called services, and services is basically financial uh, misconduct. Let's call it, and um, the, so you import everything you need. And therefore, the prices are going to go up when the pound goes down. But I want to uh, mention something about so this uh, this problem where the the real economy we keep on talking about. So all the commodities collapse, all of the uh, trade collapse, all of the the turmoil, uh, the the distressed debt level ratio in the bond market in America. The ratio is now as high as it was like a few weeks after Lehman Brothers. So all the signals in the global market are signaling a huge crisis that is happening. And yet the the housing bubble in the areas where all the journalists live that are on your television, remember almost all cities now have housing bubbles, so they all feel rich, the wealth effect. Um, I'm reminded of a story I read about the Great Depression, the beginning of the Great Depression and the rise of Hitler. And one of the things that was happening there was because we were on a gold standard, remember, and Germany was forced to hand over all this gold as reparations for World War I. And this led to hyperinflation in Germany. And what happened inside Germany before Hitler came to power was that all these urban dwellers, city dwellers, it was worse there because all the price of uh, food and agricultural products was rising so fast that they couldn't feed themselves. And what they did is the city dwellers went out into the countryside, surrounded some farms, and started beating farmers and blaming them for the gouging them on the price of food. Where it seems to be the opposite now is outside of these bubbles of the city, where everything seems fine and there's no deflationary collapse, that it's outside the city that the, the country dwellers, the suburban, the outside, the, the, the huge bubble property bubbles of New York City, Chicago, uh, San Francisco, Miami, we're seeing the, 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 a similar sort of rage, and that is like what happens when a Donald Trump pops up. That's the equivalent of them storming out into the, the city dwellers of the 1930s, storming out into the German countryside and beating up uh, agricultural producers. Here, they're doing the same thing. They, they're, they're, they, these are the people outside the cities smashing down the, the, the city dwellers. Right. The uh, reparations that Germany paid after World War I are analogous to the reparations that the middle class had to pay to the banks after 2008. Yeah. Okay. There was a $15 trillion reparations paid by savers <coughs> who saw their savings go to interest on their savings go to zero. Now they want to go to negative interest rates. And um, wages that have uh, remained stagnant to uh, falling. So uh, those are reparations paid to the banks. And Donald Trump is an ideologue. He's a demagogue. And he's tapping into this population 
And you know, just like Hitler, uh, you know, Hitler was elected. You know, he, Hitler never broke a law. You know, people say, well, is it, was it legal to incinerate people? Yeah, because he changed the laws to make it legal. Just like, is it legal for Goldman Sachs to incinerate a country to, uh, to, to foster genocide? Yeah, because they write the laws. You know, it's, it's not illegal for them. They write the laws. So uh, this is the rise of uh, definitely a demagogue. Um, I, I think there's some speculation about is there going to be some way to dislodge him from the trajectory that he is on. Uh, but uh, it seems like the status quo is woefully behind the curve on this. Yeah, but just like um, the rise of Hitler started with a Versailles Treaty. So John Maynard Keynes was there working on the, on the, you know, the treaty, the peace treaty. And he quit because he said that uh, he warned that exactly what happened would happen, essentially. He said that you don't know, if you put these sort of a uh, punishment on the defeated, you will just, you don't know what you're going to create. It's going to cause uh, just the worst thing you can imagine. And it did. It created, uh, the, it provided the groundwork for Hitler. So that's what I'm saying. When people look at, at Donald Trump and they say, Donald Trump's the bad guy. D Donald Trump is the bad guy like Hitler. Well, the, it, Hitler just didn't arise out of nowhere. He was elected, as you said. He was voted in. But where did the anger of the population come from? And that was in the reparations. The same thing here is we've been saying this since 2007, 2008, as the financial crisis collapsed and Hank Paulson intervened. And but first, he, after warning uh, all his Goldman Sachs buddies to get out of the market and uh, you know that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would be bailed out by the government, all that stuff, before they intervened on behalf of creditors around the world, before they intervened, uh, w once they intervened on behalf of creditors and bondholders in Ireland, in Greece, all that stuff, we warned that this would cause uh, unintended consequences or perhaps uh, consequences that they intended. I don't know. But, that, you know, the fact is that you could have predicted in 2008 that by the way they dealt with how this financial crash, by the way, I like the way you put it, that it's uh, reparations, that anybody with cash, anybody working, any ordinary human is being made to uh, bail out and pay reparations to the big, biggest bondholders in the world. Yeah, I mean, Hank Paulson, you remember in front of Congress, he wanted to get up to a trillion dollars in reparations, and they said that's, that big, that's a big number. You know, people will psychologically be averse to that number. So they said, okay, let's make it $750 billion. The Congress said no. Then the next day they came, and, and after crashing the market, and, the, and they said, look, if you don't give us this money, we're going to totally destroy the market. So this is similar to Versailles. I mean, this is like a warlike situation. It's like they're dropping bombs on Dresden, basically Hank Paulson dropping bombs on the economy, saying we'll firebomb you to death unless you give us this money. So they acquiesced. They gave him the money. That $750 billion turned into, depending on whose estimate you look at, Paul Mason calls it $12 trillion. I've seen estimates up to $20 trillion. It depends how you calculate the direct underwritings, the subsidies, the bailouts, the checks, the backstops. You have to add it all up. And those reparations have gone into creating this uh, fertile ground for a demagogue like Donald Trump to step up to the plate and say, vote for me because this guy's an idiot. I mean, that's basically the sum total of his speech. But the population is ready to go because they realize that they have zero chance. You know, the thing about America is that there's an old saying, fake it till you make it. Uh, you know, you, you can conceivably through guile and pluck and living on your wits go from the ghetto to, uh, you know, the CEO of a big multi-billion dollar corporation. It's not likely, but it is possible. But over the past 15 years, or yeah, since the 2008 crisis, all avenues have been shut. All avenues have been shut. Nobody's going to go up at all. It's been just completely shut down. And so there's going to be a very nasty situation. Uh, there's another in the last few minutes here. I want to discuss uh, Antonin Scalia. He died. That was big news this week. Uh, well, obviously he died like two weeks ago, but uh, he was a Supreme Court justice, died in a, uh, a ranch out in Texas in the middle of nowhere, uh, three hours from like the, uh, three hours drive from anywhere. <clears throat> so he died at this ranch 
And now it's emerged this week that he was there. It was a secret society meeting. This is like Alex Jones stuff. This is like the, the BBC, Andrew Neil, when interviewing Alex Jones, would have mocked this because this is genuine. He belonged to openly <laughs> amongst the secret group, uh, basically the Illuminati. So it's a group called the Order of St. Hubbardus. And it was founded back in the 17th century, and it was an offshoot of the Illuminati. And I mean, you can't make this up. It seems so bizarre that this, like, the, it was a secret society. They wear these green robes. Uh, Lord knows what they're doing, but I do know in secret societies how they maintain their secrecy is like what you saw with David Cameron and the the whole uh, thing in the pig's head with the pig's head is that they do those sort of bizarre rituals in order to maintain. Um, allegiance and loyalty amongst the a very elite class, the ruling class that are ruling us. They've all seen each other do bizarre things. And should you fall out of line, well, all your secrets get uh, exposed. Um, but also this week, here's an amazing story which shows you the impact of this. Scalia dies. Scalia's death, according to Bloomberg, prompts Dow Chemicals to settle lawsuits for $835 million. Dow Chemical said it agreed to pay $835 million to settle an antitrust case pending before the U.S. Supreme Court after Justice Antonin Scalia's death reduced its chances of overturning a jury award. Oh, my God. That's just remarkable. Dow, the largest U.S. chemical maker by sales, said Friday the accord will resolve its challenges to a $1.06 billion award to purchases of compounds for urethanes, chemicals used to make foam upholstery for furniture and plastic walls and refrigerators. So there's a... There, there, Scalia's death is likely to make it harder, it says, for companies to get the five votes they need to overturn rewards that lower courts uh, give to uh, complainants against these big, huge corporations. So Scalia was always a reliable, always decided on the, on the side of corporations and multinationals. Always. He always overturned judgments against them. All right. So there's the motive, clearly. Um, so this points to who killed him. Well, I don't think he was killed. The guy was obese. He had diabetes. He had ar ar artery disease. Mm -hmm. um, when these secret societies meet, what they're doing out there is there are usually a whole bunch of prostitutes and Lord knows what they're doing. So I don't know if he was engaged in all sorts of activities and, and, and bizarre stuff that put a strain on his heart, which was already weak. So I'm just saying that here is an amazing result that shows you that the, the past few years of these uh, major multinationals gaining more and more power through s things like Citizens United, through things like um, TTIP and TPP. All of these things, uh, whenever they're challenged, they ultimately make it to the Supreme Court where always Scalia and the other conservative judges would overturn it. So here is a, this actually, his death has opened it up for uh, a fight back against this multinationals uh, invading all of our privacy, all of our uh, sovereignty, mm -hmm. individual sovereignty. I definitely, definitely, definitely think the man died of natural causes, probably brought on by whatever activities they were doing over the weekend. That's a lot of money. Eight hundred million. Eight hundred and thirty-five million. Uh, Dow decided they they thought they had a case that would be overturned. They 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 assumed it would be overturned by the Supreme Court. They were probably right. Um, now they know they, they can't get it overturned, so they're not going to spend the $100 million on legal fees to overturn this case. So now the, the, the now all these cases before the Supreme Court are going to be overturned, which gives actually incentive for the Republicans to allow uh, Obama to nominate somebody. Because right here, they're, they're, you know these corporations are going to be dialing up the Republicans and saying, do something about it. Dow is a major contributor to these campaigns, as we start at the top of the show, talking about lobbyists and do donations, giving donations to parties gives you allegiance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's amazing the connections, what big money has to the Supreme Court, media, the White House. It's just, it's just. That's it for this episode of the of the Truth About Marcus on Residence One Hundred Four Point Five FM. Bye.